a college football Friday. A new assistant coach of the Jazz. Breaking news out of Brian T. Smith about Earl Watson. And youngsters learning about veterans in the NBA. All plus NFL projections and why maybe having four bigs is a good thing. It's all up on today's edition of Tip Off. Does it really screw you guys up if I do this at 9 a.m. instead of at 6 a.m.? For the most part, I'll generally be at 6 a.m., 6.30, up by 7. But I need to know from you, does this a problem? No, I'm serious on that. Uh, I've noticed a few people, if I don't get it up right away. Uh, the problem is, quite honestly, we, uh, if I, it takes some time to get this ready. And uh, I'm trying to do it well. I'm trying to do it informatively. And I'm trying to be up to date. And... Uh, I get the kids at 7 a.m., and then I take them to school and that kind of stuff. And so sometimes I don't have it as good as I want it by 6.30 when I have to start recording. And it largely depends on what I did the night before. And last night I went to parent-teacher conference and then watched politics. Uh, so I don't know. I, it, let me know. I'll, I'll, uh, the last two days I've done it this time because I thought I could make it better. But I'm getting a vibe from some of you that, hey, you know what, I catch it on my drive to work, or it fits in this part of my day. And, I mean, I, what I love about this, and why I actually think this podcasting stuff takes over the world uh, and alters some things, is because it fits your day when you want it. So, let me know. By the way, by the way, today is September 7th. Do you know... Do you know, do you know, I have a door open, it's going to echo a little bit today. If, if you go to the utahjazz.com and you click on schedule, do you realize, do you realize what, 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 what we're getting awfully close to? Yes! That's right. We play our first preseason game in Golden State a month from tomorrow. By the way, it's on the new FM station. Better signal. Make sure you grab that. 97.5 Fox Sports. And if you haven't heard already, uh, DJ PK as well as Spence and Gordon, the big show, and DJ and PK will be simulcasting on 97.5 now as well. So glue it in. Make it your number one preset, 97.5. I don't know if they have an app yet. I uh, just listen to it on my radio because I can get it now and I don't need the app like I used to to hear those guys. So uh, catch it. All right, well, the Jazz announced Brad Jones as an assistant coach. And uh, I thought, you know, I've known Brad for a long time. His resume as a co head coach is, is really impressive. I mean, he, he took a Utah Flash organization that was kind of underfunded um, and was able to take them to the – very successful in their first year, struggled the second year, and then went to the D-League Finals the third year. He then went over to Austin and won it. I thought this was interesting. I was uh, I actually been going back and forth with Brad. I know him well, and the old number I had for him was wrong. So I texted somebody who knows him and said, hey, can I get Brad's number? Um, and I love talking basketball Brad. He's just one of those guys that, that we, you, know, you find guys in the league you talk to, and this is one of them for me. Um, and I uh, texted back this guy and said, thanks for the number. Uh, Brad's good dude, well-deserved honor. And he texted back, you have no idea how good he is. And I said, as a guy or as a basketball coach? He said both. He's a terrific guy, and I really think he's going to be a great help to the coaching staff and team of the Jazz. He's a very bright basketball guy. So uh, that should be good. Uh, hopefully uh, that is the case. I, you know, It's another voice, another opinion, another view, and those guys have all got to collaborate. Uh, Gordon Monson and Scott Gerard did a nice interview with Tyrone Corbin that's up on 1280 The Zone today. Uh, I just was finished listening to that. And that's kind of an example. I took the time to listen to that. Uh, and you know what keeps jumping out in all of these conversations and everything I read this time of year? That maybe all of us don't quite grasp enough. I, I'm beginning to think I don't, so I guess I'm speaking for you through me. Is the evolution of a young player into this league and... You know, there's an article that was written out of Boston Day about one of their rookies, Christmas, I think Dante Christmas, and or second year place, and he's been working out with Jason Terry. And he's been he was just talking about how stunned he is at the level of intensity of a Terry workout 
Uh, the fact that Terry often goes back at 11 o'clock at night, um, just the level of commitment and time. And I think what happens with these guys, and I, I even think as hard as Ennis is working right now with his great body shots and the eight-pack and all that stuff, and I think we, we've probably seen it without, I, I think they're actually off, off a little bit. And, and what I mean by that is they're working hard and doing all this stuff, and they're, they think, and they're improving, and then they're going to get out there this year, and they're really going to, okay, well, where did that help me? Where did it not? And it just takes years until these guys really understand the, the level of work you have to put in. We've talked about that all week with Mikhail's stuff, and thank you very much to SLC Dunk for posting that story. I love that. Love it when we all can, gl- can collaborate, collaborate, work together. We've got such great people covering this, such great talent. Um, on the beats, all, all serving the same people. It's so cool when we actually don't, we all come together on it. And I love the fact that SLC Dunk um, did that today. Uh, so thank you. That was really cool. Uh, the, uh, where was I? Oh, and so, I, you know, I, I think these guys learn what it is to work. You know, Favors last year, first year with the Jazz was, in the offseason, just didn't have anyone to work with. So now this year he's at P3 a lot, and hopefully you get it. Uh, we're seeing Jefferson put in this dedication. He definitely was a better player last year than he was the year before uh, in a lot of ways. So I think there's just this progression that, we, that we're probably not get, we don't fully grasp as well as we need to about how much it really takes before these guys get what it takes, how to win, all those kind of things. Um, Brian Smith had an article with Earl Watson. Earl and I have texted back and forth a little bit. So he is unlikely to be ready for training camp. That's not a big surprise, but it's newsworthy. And that I, I think what ends up happening here is the door is really going to be open early. I could be wrong. For Randy Foy to get a chance to play backup point guard. Uh, and Alec Burks is going to dictate this a lot. On my third question of 20 questions to Jazz training camp, four and five likely to come today, you know, one of the things that I talked about was the where uh, Burks's progression would be. And the two guys I compared him to, if this is up on the site, we are utahjazz.com, uh, the two things I compared him to were Al, uh, Rodney Stuckey and Larry Hughes, who I think are pretty good comps. Stuckey's a little older. Hughes is a very good comp for him. In fact, I think, I'm not supposed to reveal this, but I've had an advanced copy of the Basketball Prospectus book, and I think that's where they see Larry Hughes, where they see Alec Burks, too. Uh, I know, I don't think. Uh, nonetheless, the, the amount of jump those guys took from both those guys played about 1,000 minutes. Hughes was actually a lockout season. And then they just, in their second year, they, they jump up to 24, 2,500 minutes a night. That's 20 minutes a night. Alec Burks is going to start playing 20-plus minutes a night. Where are they coming from? And the only way Burks really plays those is if Foy can be the backup point guard and you suddenly are playing kind of a three- man back uh, wing position of Hayward, Williams, and Burks, and then in that time when Foy fits with Mo Williams and play him together a little bit, but I think that's where it is, and Earl Watson's injury means Foy's going to get that chance early. Jamal will be there as a possibility, um, but Foy does more things. Jamal was terrific last year. He was, he was the ultimate professional uh, there are some elements of his uh, skills that right now are probably limiting his ability to be highly successful in some of those uh, extended moments, and that that's where he is. Uh, there could be some argument from some people that he was never a particularly efficient offensive player, if you look at him statistically. He just has a kind of vibe to him on the court that makes people uh, play well around him more than just his individual performance. Uh, so those that that's uh, that's going to be a real story of training camp of a month from today when we month from today month from tomorrow when we head to Golden State and and play that game and and see how the rotations begin to work and uh, have a full training camp for Ty Corbin to be able to put this this together. Uh, we always are talking about oh we need to you know we have too many bigs uh, all that. By the way, I just want to point out that Minnesota right now is looking for another big and they're trying out Hassan Whiteside. Okay, come on. You know, th- there is, I, I still go that a lot of the reason why you might not ever uh, make that, I mean, at some point you're probably going to have to, but the, one of the real reasons I think you're not just emptying this law, as we refer to it, log jam of bigs, is what happens on the backside of it, right? Yesterday we talked about 
that Millsap, if he's your third big, is the best third big, and Cantor, who hopefully is one of the best fourth bigs. If you slide everyone up, Cantor's probably a below-average third big right now, or maybe an average third big in the NBA in his second year, and you lose a little. And your fourth, if your fourth becomes, you know, you're adding a fourth. It's Jeremy Evans right now, or Hassan. You're at, signing a guy like Hassan. What? <laughs> Jeremy would probably be fine, but you're still on the lower end of that. So uh, be careful on on us continually talking about dealing with that log jam, uh, because I think that there's a real strength to to what we have there. Gosh, I'm excited. It'll be cool to see uh, when we get everybody together again. Uh, Utah, Utah State is tonight. I I am all. I I think this is one where I, I'm hoping I can be. I could. I'm probably going to bother someone here. I think I can be helpful here by not being as much in the mix. Uh, I've been tuned in to 1280 The Zone and 97.5, home of the Utah Jazz. And these guys are doing a great job covering. But between Scotty G, who's an Aggie, and between Riley Jensen, who's an Aggie, and, and G- Gary Anderson is, is such a great guy. He's done such a wonderful job of building up that program. And they're so much better than they were two years ago. But let's remember, you know, they lose to Louisiana Tech last year. They lose to Fresno State last year. They closed the year beating Hawaii by four, San Jose State by one, Idaho by seven, Nevada by four, New Mexico State by three. And, you know, New Mexico State by three, right? What was New Mexico State last year? That's... Uh, I know they got the big win to open the year against Sac State this year, but this is not a team that should be bestowing fear and pushing you to the wire. And I'm sure Utah State is better, but my point on this is that Utah really should walk up there and and handle, controllably handle Utah State without much difficulty tonight. Uh, if Utah is who they are, the next two weeks are going to tell us an awful lot. They're, they're playing a Utah State team that I'm sure would be in games in the Pac-12, but they certainly shouldn't win very many of them. They, haven't, they don't have a resume that would show that to you. They're improving. They're much better. Um, and, but Utah, if Utah is who they, everyone thinks they should be, third best team in the Pac-12, they should really walk into Utah State and – and handle it. I'm not saying win by 40, but they should dominate the lines of scrimmage. They should have no problem in that regard. Jordan Wynn should be in control of this game. Uh, the, the secondary should be able to clamp down. They should just be outmanning Utah State. And then next week, they're playing a team who very well could be the third, fourth, or fifth best team in the Pac-12. And then, and, and then you really – so in these two weeks, we find out a lot before they open. We're going to have a great view – of who Utah is going into this conference season. And BYU opened the year fabulously. We learned nothing this week. And then next week, as they kind of go into whatever their run is it, as an independent, you know, that Utah game tells us an awful lot. They go on the road. They play uh, a big um, – they play a big-time rivalry game. Uh, the, the concern for Utah is that the next two weeks, the games are probably more important to their opponent than they are to them. That's and, and to me, that's important – because that's going to tell me a little bit of the leadership of where Utah is. Tony Bergstrom was the real leader on that team. The, those guys last year, John Cullen actually was uh, as well. And those guys are gone. And so who's leading this team? Who is stepping forward to, to take them and to push them um, into, you know, the tough, through the tough situations and get them ready for these type of games against Utah State and BYU. Th- that's the big. So this is going to be fascinating. Tonight I'm, it's going to be uh, to learn about Utah. BYU, we don't learn anything, but next week, you know, in week three, it's the rivalry game will be done, and we will have a very clear view who each of these teams were and I, are, and I don't think either of them will change who they are after that game, uh, which is, you know, makes for a long season, uh, but it, it gives us a great vantage point early in the year. There won't be a lot of mystery to these teams. All right, NFL starts this weekend. I love what Football Outsiders does. Here are some interesting notes on them. They pick the Jets to, to make the playoffs in the AFC as the number one wildcard team despite all of the bad pub. I think 
that's one where numbers might be helpful to, to realize this team might be a little bit better. Their division winners are New England, Pittsburgh, Houston, and Denver and Kansas City all knotted up as a tie there. I, I really kind of like Oakland in that division, but um, we'll see. Now, what's interesting is they all are between 8.4 and 7. AFC South, they have Houston winning it at 8.4 as their projected win, so not as a good team. They really only have New England and Pittsburgh as 10-win teams. That Terrell Suggs injury really changes who Baltimore is in a lot of ways. No big surprises there uh, anywhere. And in the AFC, you're trying to look around, is there a team – that's going to jump forward a little bit more. Everyone kind of loves Buffalo. That Maybe they can be a 9-win, get a break, and get a 10-win team. I'm not sure I see another team in the AFC other than Oakland. I, I kind of think o- I like Oakland with, with everything that's changing uh, there. Over in the NFC, uh, they did these projections before the other night, but they have the Giants winning that division. But they had the entire Giants, Philadelphia, Dallas, Washington division within one game of each other. Uh, The dominating teams they have, they only have two 10-win teams with Atlanta awfully close. Green Bay and Chicago is the 10-win teams, both in the same division. Atlanta at 9.9. And as I mentioned, in the NFC West, they do not project a single team to be above 500. The Niners statistically cannot redo what they did last year, and it's going to drop down um, a good deal with – and, and then the question is, is anybody there a 500 team? And, and that would have to be Seattle because St. Louis and Arizona are so bad. The only reason those teams win more games than that is the five, six conference games. Both San Francisco and Seattle should be 5-1 and one inside their division in those six games before they go and play. There are others. I like Atlanta a lot in the NFC this year. I just feel like they were last year's team, and now they click in. I kind of like Philadelphia, too. Everyone's bypassed Philadelphia, but why don't they win the NFC East and then their talent – is really, really high. Uh, I, I could make a strong argument that the four or five best teams in the NFL, other than New England, are probably all in the NFC. All right, that's our tip-off today. Hope you guys are great. Have a super football weekend, and I will talk to you soon. And, and feedback, by the way, let me know on that early uh, verse 9 a.m. tip-off.